live on YouTube. They too are going to be around for a while, I think. They, they seem to have ironed out all the technology wrinkles. Wow. They and Google have a good relationship. They, yeah. And we're live now on Zoom without a hitch. That is outstanding. I've got my notes in front of me because we have quite a big episode this evening. This is week 54 in a row. Welcome, Sipsters, to another Friday Night Adventure uh, with two absolutely outstanding wine stars that we're going to get to in just a second. I want to welcome Alexandra Allen, Christopher Palm, Hans and Caitlin Greasy, who are in the house, I believe, from Colorado. Uh, Catherine Jerica, Peter Glick, Scotland Kiefer from Chicago, Sean Manning from Colorado. Uh, we're going to get into it in a second. I have to figure out why Outlook is still making noise, and then we will get that out of here. But this is an episode tonight where, we, again, in part of our educational series, we're going to dive deep into a topic that has been surfacing over the last five to seven years at a pretty specific clip. And it's getting more and more impressive. It's not just in wine, but it's in a lot of the foods. It's part of the farm to table movement, a big component of that. And it's organic farming. Uh, but before we get started, I want to share with you a couple things with regards to how people have actually been involved in this program since the beginning. I see Jeff and Jane Greasy have actually signed on. Jeff and Jane Greasy from Barrington, Illinois. Uh, probably not advisable that I give away their private address to their residents that's secluded. Uh, but they haven't missed a single episode. So there might not be a lot to do in Barrington, Illinois, but 54 weeks in a row, that is literally a, a, a toast right there, uh, which requires us to drink. Salud. But uh, healthy kids, Jeff and Jane, uh, with an amazing family that is supportive as all heck. So we are thrilled for them to be here. And just who are we? What are we doing? Where are we uh, from? Let's talk a little bit about Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company that has Google Earth. I want to show that to you because that's a little bit of a tease. A direct-to-consumer wine company that actually focuses strictly on small, limited production producers out of Napa and Sonoma. So when you are in the valley, as many of you have been to before, you travel up and down, sometimes in Napa Route 29, sometimes in Sonoma Route 1 or 101, and then off of Route 12, and you start to see all of these wineries that you've never heard of because they don't make 25, 30, 40,000 cases and have national distribution in every city. Those are the wineries we feature. Those are the ones we want to introduce you to, like we have this evening, to be able to introduce you to and bring them into your living room, out onto your patios, into your family rooms, and share with you the fantastic bounties that they're producing. And tonight is no different. And matter of fact, tonight, uh, this is probably 23 years in the making, this little episode. Uh, and with that tease, I would like to introduce you, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Bettina Seychelles and Randall Watkins of Laurel Glen Vineyards. Thank you both for joining us on a Friday night. Cheers Thank to you. <laughs> so This wine I, I, does not need to be decanted. I just wanted to say it, it is uh, known as a Cabernet Sauvignon that can also be enjoyed while, while younger. Question answered that was that was written in. That's impressive. Uh, let the record reflect that Randall is the first guest to answer live in stream a question of one of our, our attendees, which I'm very impressed with that you already saw. It. So good job on his toes. Well, when I tease that this is 23 years in the making, it's because in, in 1998 or shortly thereafter, Patina took over the national account for Quintessa. And I happened to have the pleasure of attending a Quintessa dinner in the Chicago region and met Patina. <laughs> and I, I, we, I had more hair back then, but- um, A dinner I, so with, with very um, un, un PC joking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lots of inappropriate is, jokes made at that dinner. There, uh, that's a very true statement. We won't, we won't reveal names because I think everyone signed a waiver, um, but, but certainly there were some very non-PC jokes. But this was in Chicago 23 years ago when Patina, who has grown up in essentially the wine industry, uh, was launching Quintessa nationally, and she's gone on to have an amazing career, left Quintessa in 2003 or four. Three, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to let you tell the history. But I, I want people to recognize that in the organic and non-organic world, which we'll get to, this is the first time we've actually had two people 
who have grown up in wine since they were preteens. So Bettina, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, my family has been in the wine business in Europe since the 1850s. Um, although I grew up in New York um, because my father's family, um, you know, who, who were winemakers in Germany for many, many years were also Jewish. So they left Germany in a hurry in the 1930s and eventually made it to New York. And that's where I was born. Um, but, you know, my father um, commuted to Germany throughout my childhood to run his family's business in Germany. And every summer, as soon as school got out, we would get on a plane and, you know, spend the summer in Europe so that we could be close to my father while he worked. Um, I have cousins in Bordeaux. Um, I have cousins in the wine business in England. So, you know, I, I basically spent my summers uh, in the vineyards of Germany and France and, you know, around the, the, the table of importers, you know, in all well, Germany, France, and the UK. Did um, you, because yeah. a lot of times when people grow up around an industry that their parents or relatives are in, that can either kind of woo them into the industry or repel <laughs> them from the industry. Well, so my father is the fourth generation of his family to run the Sichel family business. And my father only had girls. So I'm the oldest girl. So from an early age, it was kind of un understood that I would take over the reins of the family business. But unfortunately, um, you know, circumstances were such that my father um, was forced to sell the business in the 1990s. And that's when I moved to California and I went to work for Augusta Huneus, was getting ready to launch Quintessa and I became the director of sales and marketing for 10 years. Wow. All right. And, and Randall, you have a similar story to where you grew up essentially at a very young age walking the vines in Sonoma, mind you. Yes. So I grew up in Bennett Valley. My father had planted a small vineyard to Zinfandel and Chardonnay, and he was the home winemaker. So he didn't sell his wines. I would help him to farm the, the vines. And then all his friends would come over for the harvest party where they would hand pick the grapes and they would, they, they had this hand stimmer crusher, n nothing mechanical, all very older equipment. Uh, their fermenters were food grade garbage cans. And <laughs> he, he made- I didn't even know that really was interesting wines. Yeah, well, th that was this for the Zinfandel because you have to ferment on the skins. The Chardonnay was in beer kegs. Um, but then afterwards he would have a big picnic where they would drink wines from previous years and he would send them home with their, their payment in, in wine from previous years. It was a lot of fun each year to have the harvest parties. But so later was, I, go ahead. He was the original garagiste of the family? He was definitely garagiste. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't in a garage. However, he, he had built this very insulated cellar in which he stored the wines and um, it was perfect temperature for, for winemaking and storage of, of the case goods and, and the, uh, the barrels. So later I, I got into winemaking professionally. I worked all over Sonoma, Napa, down in Chile. And I, I do have a master's in enology from UC Davis as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, an unbelievable <laughs> amount of education. I should just say a master's of enology from UC Davis is very hard to come by these days. Yes, it's, uh, that is incredible. I mean, what was dad's day job? He was a math teacher. Yeah, so um, he really amazing with numbers, definitely, which he passed on. I, I am, am pretty good with, with mathematics and um, it's used in, in the chemistry and calculations with um, blending, wine chemistry, um, and even the, the science of microbiology and, and physics of wine as well. I was just going to ask because there, that's the science part of art, which you obviously have picked up from, from dad. And I think there's a little bit of Malcolm Gladwell here in the 10,000 hours because you were around wine for a considerable amount of time from a very formidable age at the age of 10, walking vineyards, getting exposed to the process, fermentations, all the math and stuff like that. 
Uh, so you had a, a pretty impressive leg up and then you decided to, when did you decide, you know, 16, 17, 18 years of age in high school, college, where you said, okay, I, I think I might want to do this for a living. Well, that's a good question because I, I went to UC Davis for my undergraduate as well. And I did not, I took a couple of wine classes because it was, more of the home hobby thing, but right. decided not to major, you know, when you're 18 years old, you don't know what you want to be. And so I, I was in sociology and environmental policy analysis and planning and I worked for an environmental planner in, in um, environmental consultant in San Francisco for a while, but it didn't really fit with this particular company. And I said, well, I'll go try to figure out what I want to do with my life and, and work at a winery as in the interim, do my kind of hobby for a little while. And I ended up loving it so much that I continued working my way up until the point when I decided that I, I wanted to understand the chemistry and microbiology of wine and also have that, that side, the science side, and went back to, to school and, and got the master's at that point. That, and I agree with Patina, that's a pretty special degree. So congratulations on that. We're actually better off for it because you have it, <laughs> because I get to drink kind of what you have in a glass. Uh, well, the that. interesting part was that in my class work, a lot of my fellow students had not done the hands-on winemaking. And I had worked my way up from the cellar and worked in the laboratory, I'd worked in vineyards and had, had years of experience um, professionally and then at, with my, my, my father before that, uh, before listening to the professors talking about these these uh, subjects, and it was easier for me to understand some of them than than some of my classmates. I, I was just going to ask how much of an advantage that, that gave you, or your classmates looking at you asking, "How do you know all this?" <laughs> Well, I ended up being the TA for the wine production <laughs> class, <laughs> so that that was helpful. I, I knew how to use the equipment already and, and uh, helped the professor to teach the students in, in that class. Awesome. And Patina, obviously you, like you said, it was almost uh, you were in the industry because if you were not in the industry, it would have been somewhat of a, a frowned upon to a degree. But when did you turn it from a a yes, I'm going into this industry to being extremely passionate about it to where you were pleased and, and, and grateful that this was the path you were on. Yeah, well, so I graduated from college and I went to work with my father. Uh, you know, our, our most successful product was Blue Nun. So I became the sort of national uh, sales rep for Blue Nun. I traveled the country, worked with distributors, you know, did sales meetings, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then six years later, my father sold the winery. So I was at this crossroads, what do I do now? And I realized at that point that I loved the lifestyle. I, you know, I loved uh, the people that were drawn to the wine business. You know, they're a fun loving crowd. They, right. food, you know, food is, is not a sustenance, it, it's a, a calling. And um, I just love that whole food and wine life. So that's when I moved to um, California and the Napa Valley. And um, yeah, and I, I don't, I would- And haven't, that, haven't looked back. Yeah, from, yeah, I never looked back, exactly. Nick Schramm, how are you doing? Linda Forsyth, how are you doing? Thanks for jumping in. I, Cause I, we're always fascinated here by the journey and, and it's a, um, a journey obviously filled with hard knocks and but I, I do think it's what you said is extremely important that it's the people and it's the coming together it's the enjoying of of, of great wines uh, and it's that lifestyle because it really is a a fantastic and wonderful lifestyle and uh, Denise the chief operating angel of the company I mean she grew up as an operating room nurse and what she likes to say even a bad day in the wine business is you know no one's going to die today <laughs> this is okay uh, just because the fulfillment center lost the shipment, every, everything is fine. I mean, at the end of the day, we're in wine. It, it, it's it's a it's a very and for you, Randall, and you, Patina, too. You get to w walk out to places like this, and and be kind of one with nature. And and there's a, a certain magic to that that people, I think, in in corner offices and high rise buildings don't actually get to experience. So it's a pretty special industry. 
Yeah, it's not, it's not a way to become rich, but it's a way to live a very full life. That's very well said. Very well said. Uh, so let's, let's figure out how you two found each other and, and how did you determine the pieces to put in place at Laurel Glen? And I'd like, Bettina, for you to tell me and tell us, rather, the story, because you obviously know both valleys very, very well. You had an amazing career at Quintessa. Uh, how did you decide to want to become an, an owner or a partner in a, in a property, in a, an estate? Sure. Well, I left Quintessa in actually 2006, I'm realizing, not 2003. And shortly thereafter, I, I went to work for the Nath Valley Vintners as their marketing director. And it was a really fun job. I was responsible for brand Napa Valley worldwide, but I had young kids at home and it was just not the right time, you know, for me. Um, you know, I, I was, I felt guilty leaving the office at six. There was a lot of weekends and travel. Um, so I was sort of sitting at my desk one day in now 2009 thinking, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? What's my next, you know, I, I, I need to be sort of more, uh, you know, um, I need to, to, to take charge of my life. And about that time, this very wealthy friend of my husband's who loves wine, who I've known since college days, called me and he, he did, you know, as he does every now and then to talk about wine. So we have this half hour conversation about how I can help him put together a wine related lot for his children's school fundraiser. Yep. And it's, and at the end of the conversation, he says as a joke, Bettina, you and I should buy a winery together. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and I said, ha ha ha. <laughs> and I hung up the phone and it, I had this light bulb moment. I was like, it's 2009. There may never be a time, a better time to buy a winery. So I called him back and we started talking and he said, you know, I don't want to assume all the risks myself. I'm going to reach out to some like-minded friends. Meanwhile, Bettina, you know, what are we doing? What are we buying? So initially I thought, well, we're buying a Napa Valley winery. And we did actually attempt um, to buy a couple, two different Napa Valley wineries. And the, both the deals fell through for various reasons. And then this friend of my father's called me and he said, Tina, I have just the thing for you. And he introduced me to Patrick Campbell and Patrick invited me to go to the vineyard and sit down with him and taste some, some of the vintages in his, uh, you know, in his cellar. And I, it was just this eureka moment. I was, I was like, oh my God, I will never find a vineyard of this quality that, that you know, humans can afford in the Napa Valley. I will never find a wine this distinctive you know, in the Napa, it was, it was just, it was just kismet. I, I knew right then and there that this was it. And it was, and you had not thought of until that seed was planted by your husband's friend about owning a vineyard. It really had, maybe you toyed with it, but it just, yeah, that was yeah. the, that was the seed. Yeah, that was definitely the seed, that conversation. And that was in 2000 and when? Nine, that was in 2009. And it took us, you know, two years to kind of get all the pieces in place, you know, for him to put together a, a group of, you know, investors. Um, you know, we pursued a couple of Napa Valley right. uh, opportunities. So it wasn't until 2010 that I was introduced to Patrick Campbell. And then, you know, it took a while to, you know, get the deal. We, we finally closed in March of 2011. So this is our 10th anniversary. Congratulations. And by the way, this is not a drinking game. So everyone raise a glass because uh, that's, that's worthy of celebrating as well. Um, so 10th anniversary for the, the resurrection of Laurel Glen or your ownership of Laurel Glen. And I'd be interested in learning, were there any epiphanies or, or horrifying moments where, where you're thinking, oh my goodness, what have I bitten off? What have I done? A type of entrepreneurial laying on the kitchen floor wondering how am I gonna make payroll scenarios? Well, you know, so the business I, I took over from the founder, Patrick Campbell, was 100% a wholesale business. Okay. And, you know, Laurel Glen is a very small brand. 
Um, Patrick had over the years developed a whole portfolio of South American wines that all sold for $25 and under. So, you know, that was sort of the engine that drove his business. Um, but I didn't have that. All I had was, you know, sort of esoteric Cabernets from Sonoma Mountain at, you know, super premium price points. Right. Uh, so I quickly realized that wholesale was not going to, uh, you know, I wasn't going to be able to th make things work just selling wine through wholesale unless I completely changed the business model. So, you know, I had to scramble to develop a direct to consumer business and it, it's taken a long time. It's, you know, it's one customer at a time. <laughs> That's correct. And, and when, and this is the fascinating part from an entrepreneurial draw type of thing. When did you decide that we need to turn the whole vineyard organic? Oh, even before. I mean, I, I oh, really? so, so um, you know, we, when I started doing my due diligence in 2010, you know, I, I didn't know what a healthy vineyard looked like versus a, you know, a problem vineyard. So a friend introduced me to Phil Katuri and I asked him to come walk the vineyard with me and tell me, you know, what he thought. So, you know, he was, he was the person who kind of was going to tell me, you know, this is a good investment. This is a bad investment. Right. And that, you know, so I met Phil Katuri and, I don't know, sometime in, in early 2010, I don't know, April, May, something like that. Um, and I knew even before I met Phil Katuri that I wanted to farm organically because that was the tradition I came from at Quintessa. And I totally understood that it, it's all part of good stewardship. And, you know, this, this is a vineyard with a very long history. Patrick Campbell farmed sustainably. So the vineyard was in good shape, but, you know, it could, it could be better. So um, I met Phil Katuri in, I want to say May of 2010. And by June, I had him on retainer to come in once a month and basically coach uh, Patrick's vineyard crew, you know, in, in farming practices. Now, of course he would leave and Patrick would say, yeah, don't worry about it. So, so I'm not going to happen. But the point is, you know, I was committed to Phil Katori, you know, before we even, you know, took ownership of the vineyard. Well, and I think it's important for, for people to understand who Phil Katori is. So, Randall, I'd be curious if, if you would like to take a stab at that. Well, Phil Katuri is the guru of organic farming for Northern California and in the wine industry. He's, he's definitely, he and Amigo Bob, who was actually Phil's mentor, um, who's not, not really around quite as much anymore, um, are the, the organic um, wizards, really, yeah. where he is really in touch with um, the tilth of the earth and making things, making things grow healthy. So we, we're not spraying any herbicides or pesticides or using synthetic fertilizers. Um, they, we, we grow our cover crop to lock in the small amount of soil that we have on the mountain during the rainy season. And then we'll incorporate that as a green manure in the spring when the rains stop, we can either um, disc or mow, depending on which row and how vigorous the, the, the um, soil is there. And, and in order to slow release, add nutrients back to the soil for the mines um, naturally over, over extended period, rather than uh, synthetic fertilizers would have this, these big peaks and, and valleys and um, you, you are not really building the soil that, that way. So I was going to also mention what we use for the cover crop, but you're probably going to ask that. Yeah, you can't, you can't mention that. I know Patina's going to say something. Well, Randall, um, tell us a little bit about your history with Phil, because it predates. Well, it, yeah, and before you do that, in my opinion, and I've met Phil on a couple occasions, uh, if you picture Jerry Garcia in the early years and, and, and someone who is in tune to the earth, uh, he's, he's highly, I mean, like you just said, he's the organic master of Northern California. He's the sensei of organic. He's, if you were going to have 
uh, start up a football league and you wanted to get George Hallis. And, and you know, this is the person that you have to have to be part of the program. And he's highly regarded, highly sought after. Uh, you can't get better. So it's interesting that you knew Patina early on. And then Randall, to Patina's question, you knew him before Laurel Glenn. So walk us through that. Yes, I've worked with Phil Katuri since 1999 um, when I was the winemaker for Carmen A, um, which was 46% owned by Lafitte Rothschild um, at the time. And Phil was the one that really got that vineyard going after the fires that had happened in 1996 on the Mayacamas Mountains between Sonoma Valley and Napa Valley. Um, he, he redeveloped Carmenet's vineyards and the quality that we had going forward was was better than it had ever been. I think that you can have a, a pure sense of place, a, a pure sense of flavor in the wines that are organically grown. Um, I, I've made wines from, from many different vineyards. I've made wines from uh, conventionally farmed, sustainably farmed, organically farmed and biodynamic. And I, I've, I think that you can make great wines from all. Uh, but my philosophy is using organically grown grapes uh, for the flavors that we can get and for the uh, for continuing over many years, keeping a healthy soil and not adding back things that we don't want building up into our soils. Well, and specifically, uh, by the way, I did not know Lafitte Rochelle owned 40 or plus percent of Carmenet. That's, that's incredible. Um, up on Moon yeah. Mountain, also extremely steep uh, topography there. That's, I don't think you're having a lot of farm equipment going up that slope. <laughs> no, uh, I've, I've seen we, we had crawlers. We only had crawlers there uh, because if you had uh, tractors with with wheels some of them probably would have rolled for That's certain on, on uh, some of the blocks there <laughs> well tonight we're drinking the the counterpoint and i want uh patina for you to tell me a little bit about this wine and well and randall and then tell me uh, about you mentioned your small direct-to-consumer company for the most part but walk us through the portfolio because this wine right now is uh to your point, Randall, we didn't decant. Uh, you know, it has came right out of the wine fridge and right into our glasses, and is amazing. So who wants to Who wants to take a stab at, at describing start, what everyone's drinking? I'll start with like the big picture, and Randall can yeah. talk about the wine specifically. So the first vintage of this wine was 1985. So when Patrick Campbell started, um, so the vineyard was first planted at Cabernet in the 1960s. Initially, the grapes were sold, and every winery that bought the grapes either put them in their top blend or vineyard designated them. So after a few years of that, Patrick Campbell, the owner of the vineyard, was like, hey, I can do that. So he started making wine. Uh, his first commercial release was 1981. And in 1985, he recognized that he could make his estate cabernet better by diverting the lots from the vineyard, which were more approachable, um, you know, more ready to drink into a separate wine. So he developed Counterpoint in 1985 as a way to make his estate Cabernet better. So Counterpoint from, from 1985 forward, the mission has been, you know, the vineyard lots, which are the most approachable, the most ready to drink, um, the most, you know, friendly. Um, and then when I took over, we started blending in some Merlot from our neighbor, the Pickberry Vineyard. Uh, so Pickberry also has a long history and we particularly love their Merlot. They make beautiful Merlot. So today Counterpoint is 80% Cabernet from the Estate Vineyard and 20% Merlot from our neighbor, the Pickberry Vineyard. You know, everything we do in the vineyard is to make the Estate Cabernet. Everything we do in the cellar is to make the Estate Cabernet. So, you know, this wine, um, you know, is, is basically the declassified, uh, you know, Laurel Glen Estate Cabernet, which is almost double the price. So right. it's always a, a really great value. And, and Randall, you, 
I know are going to talk a little bit about this wine, but in particular, you mentioned something a couple sentences ago with regards to you've made wine and have had wine conventionally farmed, sustainably farmed, biodynamically farmed, organically farmed. I'm not certain there's any other type of farming that we haven't covered. Um, what is the difference between each? Conventional, I understand, you know, herbicides, pesticides, that sort of thing. Uh, but walk us through kind of the high level yeah. sustainable farming means what, organic means what, and biodynamic means what. Right. So, well, uh, sustainable, it, you would be making the most efficient use of the non um, re reusable um, resources. And there are, you, you can do a lot of different additions to the vineyard, um, but you're trying to do the best you can for long-term um, health, health of the environment. Isn't um, it, uh, is the long-term measured like a hundred years or something to that effect? Or is that a wives tale that I heard? You know, I, I have never had a, a, a vineyard that we're marketing as, as sustainable. I've bought grapes from sustainable vineyards. And so I, I can't speak exactly to all of the nuances of it. However, there's a lot more flexibility with sustainable. You're trying to do your best, but if you have to intervene, then it's completely acceptable to, to do whatever, but you're trying Got to it. do it okay. as, as good as you can. Organic, it does take three years to become certified organically. Mm -hmm minimum of th three years um, to become certified organically grown. And as I mentioned before, no, no herbicides, pesticides, or synthetic fertilizers. We do like to, uh, what we've seen is that if you're spraying for, for bugs, um, unfortunately, what comes back faster is the pests because the beneficials are also perishing with the pesticides. So we, we prefer to come into a self balance with having the beneficial insects taking care of a, a good amount of the, the pests and our vines taking care of the rest where they can, they can continue to be healthy with, with um, uh, that kind of an environment. Um, we, we do have insectiaries planted sometimes where you'll have a flowering area on one side of the vineyard and on another side so the insects will fly between in order to the, the beneficials will be attracted to those flowers and they will fly through the vines to get to um, eat the bugs that we don't want in there. Um, another thing like is with um, bi biodynamic does many of the same things as organic um, and in addition, they have um, some things that I don't think necessarily help with quality. And they're, they're interesting things, and it's, it's great for the farmer to in harvesting by the cycles of the moon. Patina, I'll take this. The, um, crushing up the crystals and spraying it at a certain time on the canopy. Um, sometimes they'll take a, a steer horn and filled with manure and uh, some other nutrients and bury it in the vineyard and unbury it at a certain time and, and put that in part of their spraying regimen of, of the canopy of the vines. So th these things are very interesting to me, but I don't think it makes it better than organic, but I think it makes it another great um, option for farming healthy, high quality fruit. Oh, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that um, it's a minimum of three years to become certified organic with CCOF, the, the California Certification Organization. And then there are regular reviews. So, you know, it doesn't end when you become certified. Um, you have to continue to basically meet a certain threshold. Um, and the other thing I want to say about uh, biodynamic farming is um, basically it's organic farming and then you take into account the phases of the moon and the, you know, it's, it's basically an overlay of this, you know, very ancient, um, you know, one, one might say witchcraft element 
to uh, <laughs> to farming. <laughs> so it's 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 organic farming, and then find your your uncle who has the VW bus that used to travel up and down the countryside, uh, and and go with now, lunar it has phase. To be an ant, because it has everything to do with the phases of the moon. That's the, right. The moon and women have a much you know, stronger connection. Much, much closer time. Well, let's see who is actually- I, I mean, I think I think biodynamics awesome, but I don't want the moon to tell me when to pick the grapes. So I'm going to taste the grapes and say, now's the time. That's a very good point. <laughs> Biodynamic farming, he'd have to consult the lunar calendar. <laughs> well, and the lunar calendar is interesting from a variety of aspects, whether it's tidal, whether it's fishing, uh, certainly weather, but I, I agree with you, Randall. The moon's not out there picking grapes and, and tasting them every single day. I do want to, since uh, Bettina just mentioned something, I have a poll question, and it's going to be, let's see who is paying attention. Now, Bettina and Randall, we're going to ask for your code of secrecy because we wager money on these questions. So uh, that's illegal gambling, of course. Uh, but for $100. Really? Wait, I want to participate. <laughs> what does CCOF stand for? California Certified Organic Farmers, Coalition of Certified Organic Farming, California Citrus Organic Farming. The Chicago Cubs are on the field. And so that the company doesn't go bankrupt, everybody has to be right. Uh, we're gonna end this in five, four, three, two, one. And we've got a split decision. So for those of you that actually guessed option one, certified or California certified organic farmers, you uh, were correct. The other four people owe Denise, I, Randall, and Bettina a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are already up money. We'll get. We'll, we'll let them potentially win it back in, in round two. But I, I, I do like the aspect of the organic farming. Now, Bettina, you said it's a minimum of three years uh, right. to get the CCOF certification. A couple of questions that have always. Uh, perplexed me. And maybe it's because I've seen too many documentaries on Netflix against big ag, but you have your CCOF certified vineyard, the vineyard next to you or a 10th of an acre away is not CCOF. Yes. They are conventionally farmed. Oh, they are no, using great, chemicals. That's a great there's question. Aeros there's aerosol spray. There's runoff yeah. from rain. H how does that, how does that impact yeah, well, everything? So there are three rows of vines on our vineyard that cannot be called uh, organic. They, they always go into counterpoint because, the exterior. because they are too close to our neighbor's vineyard. It has to be 30 yards or more. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's, the, that's the stipulation in the CCOF guidelines is that your vineyard has to be at least 30 yards away from a, from a non-organic vineyard. From, from my memory, yes. Yeah, and I think I, also, I haven't studied it in a while, but that's what I remember. Yeah, and there's yeah. something about the wind, or the you know the the pattern. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't I don't remember either. But the the but the answer to your question is there are three rows of vines that we can never call organic because they're too close to our neighbor. Interesting, mm -hmm. fantastic, and it's it's funny. The other thing that has always I hear a lot from the small producers is. We've been farming organically for, you know, a couple generations. Uh, it's just cost a lot of money to get the CCOF certification from an application process and stuff like that. What is the cost? Oh, uh, well, I mean, the cost is not so much like the dollars paid to CCOF. It is, um, you know, sort of meeting the, the thresholds. So, right. you know, they come and they, um, you know, they, they send out a, you know, a representative to um, to survey what you're doing. They want to look at records of what you're, you know, what you're you're putting on the vineyard. Um, so there's a lot of paperwork involved, um, which you know is a manpower cost. There is a fee. It's it's not a crazy fee, but I couldn't tell you what it is offhand. Do you know? Right. What? Well, another thing I think Martin might be referring to is the is the farming more expensive? And yes, it is. But most um, farming um, is going to be similar costs 
The, the one that's the, the major difference between conventional and, and organic is that weed control. Weeds, they will grow. And um, if, if you're not able to spray them with an herbicide, you are mowing, you're uh, weed eating, you, you know, there's, there's, it's a lot more hand labor regarding sure. the weed control for a vineyard. And that, that's tons, where tons more, more labor costs. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a lot easier to walk through there and spray some glyphosate on it once and you're fine. But to continue with it from a manual labor standpoint, uh, especially if it's, it's steeped hillside and obviously that's the vineyard behind me. And I, I, you're absolutely right, Randall, that has to contribute to the cost from a labor perspective. And additionally, labor in California is not inexpensive. So, no. <laughs> so we're already paying higher labor costs than you would in Oregon or Washington or New York State or wherever, um, yeah, and there's a lot of labor involved. Well, the, the picture behind me is of the vineyard and we were talking a little bit beforehand, everyone, that this is one of the prettiest properties that you should ever see that you would never see because I, I wanna show you now where, uh, where this is via Google Earth because it is, I mean, Glen Allen, is not your, your main thoroughfare stopping point for wine tasters that go to the valley. And it's unfortunate because you're, there is a, a, you know, a half a dozen or more great little spots, uh, this being one of them, but let's orient ourselves to Glen Ellen, but more importantly to wine regions. So for those of you that are new, there's a lot of wine regions in the world. The only thing that's important to Cellar Angels is Napa County and Sonoma County. So that's where, that's our playground. It's it's arguably one of the greatest canvases for wine production in the world, and and we just think that it's so special. We need to tell these stories. So that's where we focus. Uh, Randall, just for you, I wanted to show people where this property was, uh, which oh, yeah. you talked about earlier, and to give people again, we we talk about proximity to water, and and how much the coastal influences have here, but this is a pretty spectacular property with some amazing topography. So you're right, I don't see a lot of conventional tractors going up these hillsides. Right, so most of the vineyard where, to the left of your pin and the winery are, are there. And then if you go above the pin, that's Monterosso, another very famous vineyard just uh, beyond uh, that, it's, which is actually below Carmenet's estate vineyard there. So okay. yeah, I was there for seven years. So for Car from Carmenet, now called, um, what's it called now? Repri. Oh, Repri. From Carmenet, now called Repri, you can actually see the Pacific. It's the most incredible views from up there. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty steep and it is uh, 1800 foot elevation on the Mayakamas Mountains. And, and you saw from your original before you zoomed in that it was really close also to the Napa Sonoma line there, right yep. on the, the Mayakamas Mountains that, that is bisected by the Napa Sonoma County line. So half of it's Sonoma and half of the Mayakamas is Napa. Well, and it's interesting too, because this gives you a great perspective for people, I mean, here's, we talk about San Pablo Bay all the time on Cellar Angels and the influence that, yeah. that it has and the induction of the cool air off of this, the cool air coming through Petaluma Gap, Gap's Crown, all of that. And you've got downtown Sonoma right here. So this is a pretty spectacular piece of property that is coastal influence, a lot of cool nights, I would imagine, given how close you are to San Pablo and, and, and really- Martin, right look, you even have the Pacific in the, in the distance, the blue, the, the brighter blue is the Pacific Ocean, and then the grayer blue is San Paulo Bay, as you said, closer. Yep. Yeah. No, that's a very, very unique place. And then, so I'm going to go to Glen Ellen, just to give people a little bit more of a overview. Not certain why there's two Glen Ellens. <laughs> well, one's um, the town and one is our vineyard that is above it. So, but I think it's interesting, people come out of Sonoma and I'm guilty of this as well. And you come out of Sonoma and you are cutting through Pen Grove trying to get right over to, and it might be 116, I can't remember my roads, uh, to get to 101 to head north. But if you stay on 12 and you cut through this beautiful valley here, you come across 
uh, this idyllic town. I don't want to maybe let the secret out because I don't want to drive up property values. I wouldn't call it a town. I think I call it a hamlet. It's a hamlet. <laughs> all the town is a little bit grandiose. <laughs> a gathering. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I like Hamlet. And we also have the tasting room is in downtown Laurel Glen. In downtown. Uh, uh, don't blink because if you go around the turn, you're through the town. Yeah. What's that? Yes. Oh, don't. No, no, you're right. The, the Laurel Glen tasting room is where the pen is. Yes. Whew. We've had some Google Earth mishaps in the past. Uh, the most famous being when I tried to do the flight simulator and fly everyone from San Francisco up to the valley. <laughs> Sorry, the reason I crossed my hands was because Glen Ellen is where the tasting room is and Laurel Glen's estate vineyard was where the other pen was. <laughs> Correct. So now, I mean, this is where the, the tasting room is, right? And, and you're right. Tina so right. I mean, this is not necessarily a town. Um, it is a hamlet, but there are some amazing properties here. Yeah. But then the winery, this better be where I think it is. Well, you know, one of the unique things about Glen Ellen is it's surrounded on three sides by parks. There's a state park, there's a regional park, there's a, you know, it's, it's just surrounded by open space. And this is a uh, the property, and I'm gonna pull back a little bit so people can actually see, give us a lay of the land here. What mountain are we looking at here? So, so that is a very important mountain because that Sonoma Mountain is the, the first windbreak against the Petaluma Gap influence as you're heading east. So if Sonoma Mountain was not there, Sonoma Valley you know, would not be able to grow Bordeaux varieties. So Sonoma Mountain forms this really important shield against, you know, the intense wind and fog that comes in through the Petaluma Gap. And as a result, the Sonoma Mountain Appalachian, which um, considers Cabernet to be its signature variety, is only on the east side of the mountain. On the west side, that has now become the Petaluma Gap AVA. So you are only able to grow Cabernet on the east side of the mountain and the west side of the mountain over here is the Petaluma Gap AVA. It has just become the Petaluma Gap AVA, yeah. It used to be Sonoma Coast, but now it's Petaluma Gap. Wow, that is, I, I like that. And, and this is, the, the hard part about Google Earth sometimes is, like judging by the slopes in the picture behind me, you yeah, don't so get to see that topography as well. Well, but so we're on a plateau at an elevation of about a thousand feet. So we're not as high as Carmenet. Um, but because we're on a plateau, we're not shaded by the sort of looming mountain behind us in the afternoon. So we get very good, we have a very good open exposure. Right, no, so we're still, look, we have, we're still looking at the pin of the tasting room down in Glen Ellen. And um, just to add to what Bettina already mentioned, um, if, you, if you think about, there is a gap in the coastal mountain range that brings a lot of cool Pacific breezes and fog to the other side of Sonoma Mountain. And because Sonoma Mountain is there, it's, it's a lot warmer on the inland side where Laurel Glen's Vineyard is and then as you go further inland to the Mayakamas, it gets a, a little bit warmer even because it's protected by Sonoma Mountain. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because you can see that now when we pan back the whole valley right here, and it's the first mountain that the breeze would hit. And, and you're right, it flattens out over here. So Sonoma Mountain is, is an integral part of being able to block that wind. That's incredible. I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, very good point. And if anybody would like to turn their camera on, uh, Ivy has, and actually interact with Bettina and Randall uh, for the remaining few minutes and, and, and ask a question, uh, it would be happy to, hang on, what, why are you looking at me like that? My camera off? Yeah. Can't be, that's wrong. By the way, Martin is really good at Google Earth. That was cool to see. Thank you. Yeah, that was. Uh, good. Glad I could help. 
So if, if Denise is gonna turn on other people's cameras or if you wanna turn your cameras on, I'm going to launch another poll question real quickly to give a couple of the four people that lost money a chance to, to win their money back. Uh, this one I'm, I'm not going to uh, tell you is any easier. Randall talked about it earlier. Cover crops. Which of these plants are used as cover crop in organic farming? Bell beans, peas, mustard, dandelion. All right, hang on a second. We've got an edit to the question. The studio is telling me that they put the question in wrong and it's which one of these plants is not, not. used as a cover crop? Not used as a cover crop. We will check with the intern in the studio to make certain that he is reprimanded because <laughs> that clearly is an oversight. No unlike, I was just going to say, unlike Randall's family's commerce system where you just get paid in wine, that person's going to get paid in milk. <laughs> the lesser known bartering principle. Uh, all right, let's see what we have. Can attendees vote? Nope. Uh, I, I hear nope. Uh, this person <laughs> in the, the no. this person in the trying to get people to vote. The the production studio is really apparently out at the drive-in theater watching a film. Yeah. All right, you can vote in in chat. Which one of these is not a cover crop? Okay, now that you're a panelist, you can't vote because the intern, uh, if you're an intern, you can't get promoted. So that person's not gonna be with the company long. Uh, all right, write it. Okay, so which one of these is not a cover crop? Jeff and Jane, 54 Greasies, <laughs> 54 Greasies. Ah. And yes, Randall, I have been studying Google Earth for 54 episodes. It's a, it's a passion. All right, now I see some people are, are waking up and, and getting smart. <laughs> Peter Glick, please reread all the options. So yes, dandelion is not a cover crop. Uh, it is a cover crop in the Midwest. It covers just about everything. Uh, but uh, Randall, talk a little bit about cover crop because, and then Patina, I think you have some pictures to show. Yes. I want, I want you guys, go ahead, Randall. Before she, or go ahead, Randall first, then Patina second. My daughter's bunny loves loves dandelion greens. By the way, they they are healthy, but uh, we we don't like them in, in the vineyard or in our lawns. Um, the cover crop is um, as as I mentioned before in, during the winter when we have the we don't we don't have a lot of rain in the the other three months in California, but in the winter we have typically good amount of rain. And if you have a slope, you don't want it to wash away your, your uh, little amount of soil that you have with erosion. So for erosion control and other means, after the harvest, usually in October, we will seed whatever we determine. And Phil Katuri is on top of this with looking at the nutrient needs of the vines. So if we need more nutrients, then we'll have more of the beans and the peas. If we need less, we'll have more of the cayuse oats, which is more like a, a very thick grass that will, will take up moisture, but not add back nutrients to the vines. And um, other, other um, legumes are the family of plants that actually can add back nutrients to the soil. And it's beans, peas, uh, vetch, which is too sticky. We don't usually like to use that, clovers. And to a lesser degree, mustard can, can be included in that. And we're looking at a little bit of peas right there. That's so some, some of the when you talk, Amanda, you said that, that there's very little topsoil. And so you're planting the cover crop uh, kind of for dual purposes. One, to hold on to whatever topsoil you have uh, during the rainy season, but also two, that to be able to disc back in or mow back in some of the nutrient. Uh, right. What happens for all of the vineyards that uh, talk about, they, they don't use cover crop you know, in their mountain vineyards. Is that just a personal preference or are they in crazy? Well, um, you could add some, some of the same things if you weren't organic, but, but um, most of them 
are not necessarily because they, they are able to use fertilizer and they'll add exactly the amount that they decide they want. But the reason that the legumes are um, able to add back so much to the soil is all other plants will mine nutrients out of the soil and take away from the tilth, except the legume family, because they're able to harness the nitrogen in the air. The air that we breathe is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And that Wait, nitrogen is not how, available. How is that not a poll question? <laughs> it's not available to any, any of the other plants except the legumes because they have a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules where the bacteria will allow them to capture that nitrogen from the air and put it back into the soil. And so that's how we're adding back uh, this green manure green fertilizer um, over slow release of time, breaking down and, and, and adding tilth to the soil, depending on how much the vines need. So maybe because Phil's been doing it for, let's say five years, this year, there's gonna be too much nitrogen. If he adds too much of the beans and the peas, he'll add a lot more of the grasses and maybe the mustard and uh, take and so do you get too much nutrients. With, too with much your bigger. math background, with your math background and your obviously your masters, do you get do you and Phil have some discussions on these ratios? <laughs> Patina. Look at Patina. Well, yes, they do. You well, never we can take your conversation from the two of them walking through a vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> now Phil Phil always knows what to put in, in, in there, except the only argument we have is. Sometimes he'll put too much mustard and I'm not a huge fan of the mustard because it grows so tall. It gets up into the canopy of the vines and it looks beautiful. You know, you, you drive around Napa and Sonoma and you see those yellow vineyards and it, it looks really nice, but it seeds for many, many years and you can't control the amount you'll have in the future if you have too much mustard. So I like a little bit more control knowing how much mustard we'll have rather than it's, it's taking over everything. Yeah. And um, I'd be curious, by the way, Patina, go back to those pictures for a second. I want people to actually see if you may please uh, a year in the life of the vines. Cause I think this is, is, is really uh, a nice pictorial representation. So the cover crop is, is perfect. And yeah, that gives you an idea of the, of the mountain. I mean, it's just a beautiful vineyard site. So uh, the picture on the left is basically right after uh, pruning. So we typically prune, you know, in February, end of January, something like that. And then in winter time, you know, we, when we prune, we leave the, the, the prune material. Um, well, I don't know. The canes. You tell us, Randall. So we, we Okay, so the canes are just left in the middle of the row. And um, then we can go in when we're going to mow or disc and we can thresh those into the soil. It's nutrients lost by the vines anyways. So it right. adds back almost like a compost in a way um, w along with the cover crop, which hasn't yet thrived because this is um, middle of the winter. Whereas by the spring, the cover crop would be maybe a foot or two high. No, um, in the upper right. Yeah, yep. so you, you can see it on the upper right. And that one also has some of Bettina's favorite, the daikon radish, which is it's in it's it's a in the family of, of mustard too. It's related and and doesn't grow quite as tall, but um, has this nice tap root. And what is the methodology of uh, one row of cover crop is still there, and the other row of cover crop is mowed? Yeah, yeah so or is that just for, for pictures? So. Uh, um, we often will change those rows each year or depending on how much Phil decides needs to be disked in. So with this one you're looking at, um, every other row has been mowed and then that row that has not been mowed is going to be disked. So depending on how much um, he thinks needs to be added back to the soil, um, it, it may, may, we may just mow every other row and disc every other row back into the soil. So the third photo, um, Bettina was probably going to mention is, is really af right after bud break. So you see the shoots are pushing out and it also shows apical dominance that the end shoot has pushed before the next 
one. The next one is just barely pushing. Um, that the vines have been dormant for the winter and now they're waking up in the spring. And each of those shoots is going to end up being a cane that has potentially two clusters and a bunch of leaves above it but to ripen it. So we'll look at um, the balance of the vine. If it has set two clusters per vine and the, sh the shoots are too short, we might remove one and just have one cluster on the, um, let's say if it's 18 inches long, we'll, we'll keep one cluster. If it's 24 or more inches long, we'll keep the two clusters. If it's only 12 inches long, which is unusual, but there's weak shoots, we won't even have any clusters on that because it doesn't have enough energy and leaf area to ripen the clusters. So that's how we balance out our, our crop there. And the third, the fourth picture is really, that's the potential clusters. These have not even flowered yet. They haven't had cap fall. And once, this is typically in June, um, the, these potential clusters will flower, they will bloom and the, they self-pollinating. So that's why this stays Cabernet Sauvignon rather than being a hybrid of something else. If, if you were to push at the right time flowers onto th this vine from a different variety, you would have a hybrid of the clusters just for that year. And then the next year it'd be Cabernet Sauvignon again. But huh. that, so what is, that doesn't what happen. Is, that, that's, that's very unusual. It would be a manipulation by a human usually to have a hybrid. What is cap fall? I'm familiar with sky fall, the bond yeah, so, fall, but not, not so, cap fall. Well, if you were really close to these, and I can imagine it because I have been there, um, there is a cap over the um, what's going to be the berry if it get, becomes fertilized. So when right. it flowers, the pollen fertilizes the seed, and then it's set. This is going to be fruit now. If there's poor weather, such as crazy wind or a lot of rain, um, that pollen might be washed off and you could have pore set and not have a lot of berries. You might have um, a stem with about half as many like um, 2015. grapes on it. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because we've shatter. talked a lot. You get shatter. Yeah, we've talked a lot about this in the last several weeks with regards to uh, bud break flowering, and then fruit set. And there's a lot of things that have to happen in there with mother nature cooperating, because if any one of them get altered, you won't get fruit set. And I think you're seeing a little bit of that in Burgundy right now with a number of different oh, things. Yeah, um, We talked about it last week and I'm, I'm seeing some horrific numbers about 90% of the vintage because of the timing did not get fruit set. Yes, yeah, so this is a good picture to show the, those those stages definitely. Yeah, um, and it also shows that we didn't mention, Bettina, um, our method of pruning, which is the double guillo method used in Bordeaux. You have um, this is actually two... a better oh, picture. Oh, that's better. Yeah, we we like to arch the canes um, so that we don't have that um, end bud pushing quite so early. We'll have to more of a um, each of the shoots are, is pushing more at the same time. But you see going each direction, my thumbs are kind of depicting it, the head of yep. the vine, and then the two canes, which are one year old, the trunk is, is the permanent wood. There were a bunch of those canes and we chose which cane was going the right direction, which looked like it was strong enough and healthy enough and um, pruned the vines in February, let's say, and just chose two that are going out to be our, our fruiting canes for the year. The other, other methods are head trained. You have probably seen the gobelet, which is arms going in all directions, or the bilateral cordon, which has the two permanent arms and just has spurs coming off of that, which, which will be the, the, um, the, the fruiting spurs rather than fruiting canes. That's awesome. But um, to, give make you, sense? to give you some perspective, uh, so in 2014, from our 14 acres, we harvested 38 tons of fruit. In 2015, we had terrible shatter. We harvested 17 tons of fruit. So just, you know. So less than half. Yeah. Yeah. So how are they able to make the exact same amount of two buck chuck every year? <laughs> 
Well, it's <laughs> not they, come from a single vineyard. <laughs> Martin, make. That's the <laughs> <laughs> because well the, well the reason I, the reason I'm saying that is because it, they they buy wine bulk in bulk from other wineries and blend it together like a negotiant in, in a way where um, wineries that have more than their case goals or they have a certain amount of wine that's not good enough to make the cut for their blend will sell wine on the bulk market to other wineries and Two Buck Chuck really doesn't make any of it. They, they buy all bulk wine and blend it together. And that's it, what, how they're able to do it so inexpensively. Yeah, but it's just, you know, here in Sonoma and in Napa, you know, a typical Cabernet production is about, you know, two and a half to three tons per acre. If you go yep. further inland to the, to the Central Valley, typical Cabernet production is nine tons per acre. So, you know, it also depends where you're looking for your fruit. Too true. That's incredible. And then, so summer, you've got these beautiful ripe clusters, very well defined small berries with intense flavors. We're very proud of how small the berries are that we ripen on the, on Sonoma Mountain. Um, and really, the smaller the better for flavor because the skin is so important to you know the the color, the flavor, the tannins of the wine. So the higher the ratio of the skin to the juice, the more good things in the wine. So we're very proud I, of how small our berries are. And the, the counterpoint in particular, uh, tell me a little bit about the winemaking style of this wine and, and how on earth you're able to craft a wine at, at this price with this quality. Randall, I'll leave yes. that to you. This is, I'm, uh, yes. look at the uh, So big fan I saw, Sure. I, um, I actually don't um, predetermine the, the, the um, blend each year. We, we decide later what <clears throat> wines are going to make the cut for Counterpoint and Laurel Glen Estate. So they are, are made very similarly. They, the grapes are coming. The estate wine is going to be 100% from our estate and Counterpoint part of it's going to come from some of our neighbors. And we are hand picking the grapes, as you can see in, in this photo, um, not machine harvested. Um, and we bring the grapes to the winery and de-stem them. We, we will, well, there's another picture of me sorting the grapes. <laughs> we will hand sort the grapes on the conveyor belt and then gently de-stem them where the whole berries go along, they're bouncing along this um, berry sorter right above the uh, hopper there. And if there's any berries that are green or raisin, they will fall through the slats and the perfect whole berries will bounce along to this um, hopper, which we can then gently pour into an open top fermenter where um, we have small stainless steel tanks. Traditionally, Laurel Glen has been native yeast fermented, so I don't inoculate our Cabernet Sauvignon with, with yeast. I allow it to slowly start and build up temperature um, as, as the yeast is, is growing and eating the sugar, converting it to, into alcohol. What I do to extract the color and a lot of the flavor is a mixture of both hand punch downs, which is a very traditional old style of winemaking and, and much more labor intensive and gentle irrigations where I'll pump the wine, the juice from the bottom up and over the top and have an irrigator on the, on the cap in order to um, keep the cap wet and extract the color. The skins rise to the top during the fermentation and I want to, uh, to extract the color and the flavor from the skins, but also uh, keep it wet and healthy during the fermentation for the yeast. And, and curious, ignorant question by me, of which they all are, your CCOF in the vineyard, and if you were to then bring the fruit in and inoculate with artificial yeast, would the introduction of an artificial chemical negate or does it stop at like the growing? Well, it, um, yeast that has been gr grown in a laboratory, I, I wouldn't think of that as being 
artificial, artificial. artificial. Right. No, no, it, it's right. it's basically protein, which is um, natural, and yeast yeast is naturally found. It's it's found in the air. It's found in the winery. It's found on the on the grape skins. Yep. Um, but uh, we, we like native fermentation. It's a little riskier because things could go wrong. Where you could have um, more vinegar, you could have more stinky aromas. But um, oh, Patina, I feel for you. The, the the potential for having more complexity is also there, and we're willing to take that risk to make a more interesting wine. Um, and and uh, when I'm making my Sauvignon Blanc for Laurel Glen, I do inoculate with a yeast because we keep it at a very cool temperature. And native yeast would not necessarily make it through that. You would have to right. have a yeast that that handles cold temperatures. Um, so the next step is to, we, we will press off the wine, go to barrels for the aging. And that's when we need to start choosing which wines seem to be a little bit lighter, softer tannin, and would, would be more potential for Counterpoint. Counterpoint receives a little bit less new oak than our estate wines. And um, the other thing, well, Bettina mentioned, I, I have to say, this is actually the only year that Patrick Campbell, my predecessor, pioneer of California winemaking, amazing winemaker, he had planted grapes on some of our neighbor's property. And so it was leased land. When he sold that property to a new owner, they ripped out these beautiful old vines Cabernet that Patrick had planted in the 70s and planted new vines Cabernet. Well, that's fine. New vines Cabernet, it makes good wine too. And a little bit of Malbec in 2016, I purchased Malbec for Counterpoint uh, because I thought it would be really fit into this profile. This is 10% Malbec, 10% Merlot, and 80% Cabernet Sauvignon with this wine. Wow. 2016 was actually a wonderful vintage. It was following many years of drought, 2012 through 2015. We finally had enough rain to fill the soil profile and that the vines weren't quite as stressed, although stress can create quality as well. Our hillside creates plenty of that. We wanted the water. Um, I love the flavors in this wine. There's a lot of red and dark fruit, both together, a great freshness to this wine. And it, for, the reason I said it doesn't need decanting is because it's not so young and it's not so old. If it was very young, I would vigorously decant it in order to give some air to the wine and open it up. It's just so tight. It's not at that stage anymore. It's had a few years in the bottle and it's not so old that it has a bunch of sediment that I want to very gently decant off of those settlings to have a clean glass of wine without oxygenating it because it's so delicate. It doesn't need the, the, the air with the older wine. I, I'm, I think I'm in both camps right there. I do find that, I mean, mine's decanted in the glass. So as yeah, we've been talking, exactly. it, it is basically uh, opened. It, it's, I think right now, well, first of all, it's empty. Um, so there's a problem that I need to remedy quickly, but it, it, the last several sips and even the bouquet were, were more expressive after 60 minutes or so in the glass than, than what I had right out of the bottle. So I love, I, and by the way, everyone knows we're drinking out of the BV7s from Bottega del Vino. Uh, these things are amazing and they're, they're just awesome stems, 100%, uh, you know, handmade, mouth blown out of Verona, Italy, but they, they do a wine well. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't spend at least a minute or two uh, Bettina, so good to catch up with you. I, I can't express enough how, how grateful we are for the opportunity to do a deeper dive into Laurel Glen. I would like everyone on your next trip out to wine country, uh, you can follow our pictures on social media because I'm stopping by this. Yeah, you're stopping by here. Scotland, sorry, you're going to have to go back. Scotland just got home from wine country and, and now he recognizes son of a um, fill in your expletive that uh, he missed this vineyard because it's a special, special place. And I love learning that Sonoma Mountain is the wind block for the Cabernet vineyards and the organic farming is, is, is special. Uh, 
Randall, fun fact, I think I first had your handiwork in the 1990s at uh, Hartford Court. If uh, I, I believe you were there during that period of time. And uh, that was first time where my head snapped when I'm like, oh, now this is some good Pinot Noir. Uh, so that, that basically threw me, but I believe that was your handiwork. But I'm gonna fill up a little bit of a glass, give you both a toast because uh, we learned a ton about organic wines and the organic process. Uh, and I know that in the not near future, we will never see a bullhorn filled with manure on your property. Uh, so, so there's a guarantee. Uh, but th thank you both for the time. Uh, we enjoyed it. I, I, I hope you both stay healthy, well, and can continue to produce this. The Laurel Glen portfolio is something to be proud of and certainly something we are happy and, and thankful for having the opportunity to share with our viewers. So Thank you. Can, can I give a, sh a shout out before you, you sign off? I, I just was noticing all of your people here and there's all these names that I'm rec recognizing. Well, first, uh, Shram well, from Jay Shram, Shramsburg. That's such a gr great sparkling wine, Jay Shram. <laughs> but you Look know, Nick's like at Rutherford, I, one of the I, best I, places for Cabernet Sauvignon in the world. I just want to know that I'm taking Chris Palm to the vineyard tomorrow. So okay, Chris Palm, Chris Palm tomorrow. Uh, D Derek Palm is uh, the, the owner of the mobile bottling line that we use. What, I think the best bo bottling line in Northern California, uh, select mobile bottling. Uh, Kiefer, great Pinot Noir vineyard. I mean, I could go on and on. So it sounds like a, a really... We have, we have a very group intelligent have. group. This isn't our first rodeo with these people. They know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, you guys are awesome thanks for spending a little extra time with us really appreciate it and i love the knowledge on organic that is a huge educational feat tonight understanding all the aspects that go into organic farming with the ground with the cover crop and everything that you do and and thank you for being stewards of the land that really does make a difference cheers to you both cheers to all of the angels everyone stay safe be good to one another and definitely share a glass of the good stuff thanks so much everyone we'll